I'm so excited that you're watching from wherever you are. This is going to be our last Café Kratsch for a while and definitely for this year. So I'm really happy that you're spending um, your second advent with us. And I'm very excited to have you here today. Uh, we've known each other for quite a long time. So it's been definitely overdue that you're joining us here today. Um, yeah, again, I'm Franziska. I've been moderating Café Klatsch with Wissenschaft Science Communication Café since God, um, August 2019. So we've been doing it mostly online, actually. But I think we've been doing pretty well just doing it remotely as, as well as possible, I feel like, with the support of the amazing team. So thank you so much. And yeah, I'm excited that you're here today. Thank I think, oh God, I, I started at the museum in 2009 as an intern. <laughs> but we didn't know each other until like a, a bit after. I think I saw you at like conferences or like... You know, I think there was like a thing here where I saw, you know, like, oh, she's so cool. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. We, I, I think I've like admired you from afar for a while because you were like more advanced in, the, in your career than I was. I was like a young woman trying to get into paleontology and you were already doing it. So um, now we're here. I'm not so excited, really. And yeah, so I would like to ask you a few questions because mm -hmm. I've been knowing you like you for a while but our guests have no idea possibly who you are or don't know you as well as I do so yeah thank you so much again for being here and my first question is always how my guests ended up in the career they are doing now so how did you end up in science do you have other people in your family that are also scientists or paleontologists are you the only one like how did this happen well, first of all, I would like to thank you, Francie, because as you know, I was indeed waiting for your call for being <laughs> here for a long time also. Oh, no. <laughs> and yeah, finally, yeah. we made it. I forgot, honestly, yeah. But yeah, and I would like to let you know what I'm doing. And yeah, I hope you like it. And you. about your question, mm -hmm. uh, no, I'm indeed the first one in my family that has pursued a a career in the science or even who has studied a, a university degree um, and how did I reach I, I end up being here did okay. you always wanted to be a paleontologist like no. when you were a child or no 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 I mean uh, uh, that is funny because I one of the childs that were grown, grown up with these uh, Jurassic Park movies in 1992 93 yeah, yeah. I was five and, yeah, I was. but that's the problem that I was afraid of dinosaurs. Really? <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to go to the movies to, to <laughs> see the film. Yeah, it was a, in Spain we had when the VHS mm -hmm. was released and the the title said get it before it gets extinct or something oh, like that. That's and I say, oh, I just, uh, it doesn't care. Okay, go extinct. I don't want to see this movie. <laughs> I hate dinosaurs. I'm afraid of them. Um, but then something weird happened and with 11 years old or something like that, a, a really huge book, huge for a child, a, with black cover, hard cover, mm -hmm. arrived in my hands. And when I opened, I started reading it. I couldn't finish. I, I mean, I couldn't stop until I finished. Was it a dinosaur book? Yeah, it was a, The Lost World of Michael Crichton. Oh, yeah, that was my first thing. That's the second one, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I started, it started with the second one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. But I said, what is this? Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. I really love these paleontologist things. I mean, this soon I realized it's not like in this book or in the other books or in the movies, but that's the exact moment when I fell in love with uh, paleontology. Interesting. And, yeah. And after that, I remember asking my teachers, oh, I want to study dinosaurs. I want to be paleontologist. And my teachers in Spain, what is that? I yeah. mean, maybe you should study archaeology. You should okay. study history. And I said, well, I'm not sure. But if I want to study animals, maybe I should go for biology or mm -hmm. something like that. And yeah, in the end, I, I knew that I should study or geology or biology. 
And as I love more living things, <laughs> I mean, uh, I decided to go to into biology. So um, you did your bachelor's. Um, so so where are you from? Did you do your bachelor's ah, yeah. in Germany or did you no, do no, it? No, no, it's true, it's true. I forgot to say. I I study the bachelor's in, in Spain, in Madrid. Mm -hmm. And then I get a PhD, well, a pre-doctoral uh, fund mm -hmm. for studying dinosaurs in Bilbao, also in, in Spain. Okay, so you've been in Spain for yeah. a, a big chunk of your education. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. so I think most of most it, of it. Yes. All right, and how did you end up in Berlin? Were you just like, I'm done with Spain for a while, I need to move, or did you come specifically for a job that was advertised? Like, how did you end up at the museum? Because you work here, right? Mm -hmm. The museum. It was also funny because um, when I was doing my PhD in Spain, part of the thesis, well, you will see in the presentation that. For being a paleontologist, uh, that also means going to another institutions and look for the specimens for comparison purposes, etc. And yeah, in 2011, I came here to the museum. I met uh, Daniela Sparks. I met my supervisor. Yeah. <laughs> I also met Heinrich Malison. Oh. One of, yeah, one of the you will see later too. <laughs> uh, one of the um, biggest people working in photogrammetry mm -hmm. in the world. Yeah, he's big on that. He yeah. taught me a class at university once about that. Like, ah, yes. yeah, I'm excited for you to talk about this topic. Uh, yeah. this cool. I love it. So, and he, I remember I was just looking at the Yarafa Titan material in the bone cellar and he was with a pen or something like that, like drawing an ilium of a dinosaur like this with a pen. But when he was drawing, the the ilium this appeared in the in the laptop too like a oh, 3d model a 3d image and said, what are you doing <laughs> magic. because yeah i i come from a really classic approach the one that you describe the dinosaurs you make uh, drawings you compare them but he was bringing this bone into the laptop with a pen it was yeah. really weird yeah. And I remember asking him, oh, I really want to learn how to do this. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. But then I went back to Spain. I finished my PhD. Uh, I also, I think it, this is important. I also have my first child. Mm -hmm. So I have like a stop. I had a, a stop there in my career. No, um, you were like a, a superstar in between. Like you finished your PhD and you had a family. Yeah. Like, that is... So a lot. Yeah, so, indeed. It's not a stop in the, I mean, not a stop in the career, right? I feel like it gives you a different perspective maybe mm -hmm. on your career. So yeah, I, totally. I'm very impressed by you. Oh, no, in case you don't, you don't already know. <laughs> well, but after that, uh, I started applying for postdoc positions. And that is why I remember, oh, wait, there was this man in the Museum of Naturkunde in Berlin who was doing these amazing, cool things. Maybe I could try getting a, a position there for working with him. And it worked. <laughs> so <Great. laughs> uh, I get the funding and I came to Berlin in 2015, if I remember well. All right, and, okay. Yeah. I was and, just doing my, my master's, I think. Yeah, I think more. Uh, Was that? Yeah, I think so. That's my first year. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Crazy. It's been, it's been a long time. So you've yeah. also been here a long time. Yeah. Well, and from them, I have I have been putting together postdocs projects, mm -hmm. and until now, I'm still here. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you are. Oh, thank like, you. I, it's it's funny that your um, kind of paleontology origin story is a little bit different. Where you're like dinosaurs suck and. I, I was I went to um, cinema with my parents when Jurassic Park came out yeah. and I was five and I remember watching the scene with the T-Rex biting that lawyer on the toilet and I was like awesome <laughs> I was like yeah. so into it I was like that's amazing I want to see this like 10 more times and I loved it and I loved it because the woman in it had my last name oh uh, yeah true and fun fact whenever I went to conferences and stuff um, people who have only met me on social media, like other paleontologists, when I they first met me in person, they said, oh, Sadler is your real name. I thought that was like a fake social media name because of Jurassic Wait, Park. I like, also thought that the very first time. <laughs> what? <yeah. laughs> no, that is my name. Yeah, yeah, it's my name. And um, 
my it's it's a good name in paleo no? it's a good mm. name to have yes. and um my partner's last name is morrison um and the whole formation <laughs> named after morrison like this this family is just like destined to be connected yes. to paleontology really <laughs> but yeah for me it started much younger um but honestly like i feel almost feel like yours is better you did a full 180 you were like no <laughs> i don't I want was that. really afraid i don't know why I mean... but you did you did bio, biology right like i did yes. geology so i studied rocks for those who don't know like that is mostly looking at rocks and different things like that and then in my master's i switched to evolutionary biology because i was so sick of talking about rocks that don't oh, have yeah. fossils in them i was like metamorphic rocks i don't care like <laughs> if it's not like anything to do with sediment and fossils i don't want to do it so i switched so i think there are different um, ways you can get into paleontology mm -hmm. which is cool because some people don't know that you can't study paleontology it's like it's like yeah, usually true. that's not a degree you can't get a bachelor's in paleontology it's more like a specialty right you yeah. kind of specialize either through biology or geology so i think it's cool because i was a bit scared of biology it's like oh i don't know if i'm good enough so i started with geology oh, that happens uh, simple to me with geology yeah. i mean every <laughs> time i do to i need to do the geological context it's so hard paper. Oh it's too God, much physics <laughs> it's too much physics yeah yeah i enjoyed the biology a little bit better but i'm glad that you ended up here again and you work on sauropods right can you mm -hmm. quickly tell us what a sauropod is for those oh, who don't know that is easy okay that is easy because <laughs> i think it, they are the most is the easiest the dinosaurs to describe these are the uh, well in general terms the ones that have uh, small heads and long necks and tails. They're very large, uh, right? Yeah. yeah. But the thing is that this is not completely true. This is uh, only to let the people that, yeah, these are not the T-Rexes ones or the ankylosaur ones, these are the, the large ones. But it is not true, as I said, because we have a lot of differences between them. There is a huge disparity. And also in, in sizes, because we can find really small species, like, I don't know, maybe five meters long. Well, I mean, the one, on <laughs> there, is, there is one we found in um, in Germany, actually, right? Like, yeah, uh, Europasaurus holgeri. It's like a yes. dwarf one. It's yes. tiny. <laughs> But it's then cute. you can also find the large ones, like the the ones you can find in in Argentina mainly. So, oh yeah, uh, yeah. you have the big boys over there. Yes. All of my friends that are from Argentina, I'm always like you guys. You have big yeah in big Argentina and, and the USA, they are always fighting about who has the the largest dinosaur ever oh, found. Yeah. yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> but I think Argentina is winning for the moment. But yeah, I think so. So usually, if you're not um, a specialist. They have tiny heads, long necks, mm -hmm. and they're quite large. Right? Yeah. And we have uh, one of them, or like a few of them actually, in the museum mm -hmm. hall the here. Hall. So if you come to the museum in Berlin, you'll see them in our dinosaur hall. Yes. So now that we know what sauropods are, maybe you can share your slides and show us mm -hmm. what you're working on because okay. it's super interesting and I'm very excited for people to see. So before starting, I think, yeah, here. you can press the X there. Ah, okay. Because people can hear us still, I think. Okay. Yes. And now here. And this one. Yes. Again. Eh? Okay, I'm going to start from the beginning. That would be good. <laughs> <laughs> Where is the mouse? Okay. Here and, and here. Can you guys see them? Perfect. All right. Cool. I like your title, by the way. Oh, thank and we're gonna, you. I think we're going to learn why you're bringing back dinosaurs to life. Or at least we are trying. We're trying. I mean, it's not like um, the thing that is uh, Jack Horner trying to do about the Chickenosaurus. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, but, well, at least we are going to try to do it in a different way, more digital. Yeah, <laughs> Jack Horner is a very, very famous paleontologist, and uh, he's been in pretty much every dinosaur documentary ever made. Yes, true. And um, I don't know if this is a confirmed thing, but I think uh, Alan Grant from Jurassic Park is like inspired partially by him because it's a real person. So I think um, yeah, he's a he's a famous one. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so also in relation with that, when I imagine you had also the same experience, but um, 
I also like to put this video when I start speaking about paleontology to the general public because when I ask somebody, okay, if you need to think about a paleontologist, what would you come to what would come to your mind? No, like for example, and they usually speak about yeah, Jurassic Park of and uh, a man with a hat and uh, digging a brush and a brush. <laughs> yeah, a brush always is really easy to to dig a bone, as you yeah, can it's see. It's not yeah. difficult at all. No, <laughs> and and they always appear so magnificent, inarticulate, in articulation, almost complete. It's, They're just lying there perfectly yeah. for you to find. You say, and <laughs> yeah, I think we can both assure you that is not the case. That depends a lot on the geology of the formation, and most of the time. Uh, the fossils appear isolated or in bad preservation. So yeah, it's a pity. I would also love to find fossils like that. That would be amazing. But, yeah. The job would be done much quicker. Yeah. True. Sometimes you go back to the dig sites several years in a row because field yes. season is just at a certain time, right? You can't do it all year long. In Montana, where this video was filmed, uh, I've done field work there and it I starts in May and it finishes in August. There's not a lot of time, so because also it doesn't look like that in the video, but it snows a lot. It's either hot or it snows a lot. You have very short time to do everything you want. It never looks like that. Right? <laughs> never. It's a pity, but and also a really nice thing is that I haven't seen yet one machine like this, one of these devices for sending waves to the to the soul or the floor and yeah. then getting the resolution. perfect picture yeah yeah I mean, this was filmed in the 90s so you would assume like if we had this now it would be like a perfect 3d model right yeah totally um, so please technicians working on this kind of things so yes, yeah but also it, i keep on to doing field work so maybe yes. that would be a shame <laughs> yeah, he's talking about in the video i think about how we won't even have to do field work anymore in the future. It's like, it's been 30 I, years since this movie still, came out and we're still doing it, so. No, but it's, it's really nice because this way we also have work to do. Yes. One of the things that you also speak in the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Paleontologists yeah, are going to disappear, we hope no. But... Yeah, yeah. But yeah, mm. so you, you just confirmed that it's not like that at all, right? Sometimes you find mm -hmm. a few bones together and sometimes not. You find them 30 meters away or not at all yeah and i think it all depends on how the animal died and if they were washed the remains were mm -hmm. washed away by a stream or scavengers taking things right um it's the same with if you find i mean i've never found a carcass luckily in the woods of like an animal or something but they're scavengers who take stuff yeah and it's it's the same <laughs> things disappear so it's very rare I think that you mm. find anything like that. And also, uh, continuing with the, when we speak to the uh, general public, I think there is a gap of uh, people when we say, okay, now we have found the fossil and then what happens? And they usually say, well, now to make the reconstruction and you can use it in movies and documentaries and like that. But yeah, in between, what do paleontologists really do? Because I mean, there should be something in between. We need to work to, to discover things, to compare. So yeah, it's a little bit more difficult than, than that. And I hope with that with this presentation, you will get an idea of the current state of paleontology right now. And for that, this is also important because I think museums are really amazing part of a research and most of the people only know the specimens the dinosaurs in this case as we are speaking about dinosaurs from the main halls and the cabinets and and everything the holes in the museum but also in the collections there is an amazing quantity of specimens that we can use and with these specimens we can do a lot of research like for example these classical studies in which you take for example the bones this is these are sauropod bones you can describe them make comparisons with other species then you could you can do a, a phylogenetic relationships that is when you compare different species and see how connected are between them it's like a family tree right yeah. so yeah True. I never liked that very much in university. It was because we had to use computer 
programs hmm. you know that make these trees yes and you have to really make sure you have all the different characteristics or oh, like you know like a how a bone is shaped or like how like a vertebrate is and if an animal is more closely related maybe there are similar mm -hmm. characteristics and these would just make insane trees and i would just sit there i remember i studied abroad in montana for a while and this was one of the classes and i just had a headache every day <laughs> Yeah, I totally it's understand hard. You. It's hard. Yes. Yeah. As you can see, I mean, it looks quite complex, right? So, yeah, um, there are lots of. Lots and of I, I also remember once that is also important. Why it's important to go to the museums and other institutes to to see the material they have for making comparisons, because, uh, for example, if you have in one of the characters that you need to look is uh, this specific character in this bone is large or small and you say okay if i compare it with this with the one i have just in my other hand this one is huge but this is small and i remember going to i think it was in la plata in argentina mm -hmm. and so in this a uh, bone of another completely different uh, sauropod specimen uh, from another taxon and it had this uh, feature really large but amazingly large and you say Oh my God! What yeah. have I been coding in my in my matrix? Is no, it's incorrect. So, because you didn't have it yet. You, you yes. thought this is large, and then Argentina comes at you with something yes. bigger, as always. <laughs> they were like, "Here you go." So that is why oh, you need to have a lot of information, mm. and well, they are indeed, as you said, really difficult to do. But well, this is one of the things that you can do with fossils. And um, thanks to new devices and technologies and methods, some of them even taken from another uh, uh, fields of research or, the, or the sciences, you can develop, for example, in this case, we made a 3D reconstruction of the musculoskeletal system of Yara Fatitan. This is the tail and the hind limbs. And you can see here in colors the, the muscles mm -hmm. we reconstructed. And that's the one that's in the dinosaur hall, yeah. right? Yeah. Cool. <laughs> the one with the Guinness record. Of course, <laughs> yes. yes. It's important to mention. Yeah, it's important. We, we're, yeah. proud, we're proud of that. <laughs> and also in relation with this, uh, because for doing these 3D models, uh, we had to digitize in 3D, in this case, the, the bones of this uh, dinosaur. But I would like to make a focus on this, although I think you have a few months ago uh, in Cafe Clats also Frederick Berger, Mm -hmm. who was speaking also about the importance of the digitization of collections, in this case in the Museum for Naturkunde. But I also love to make a focus on this because this is the future of a natural history institutions. Um, indeed, a lot of them are currently working with the digitization of the collections. And most of the people could say, OK, if we have the physical specimens, why won't we have, uh, for what? It's important to have a digital uh, specimen, no? Well, in this case, as you can imagine, I will put it here, I will go a little bit fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, it reduces the impact of frequent handling of the specimens. Imagine if you need to take a bone and look a lot of at, at it, uh, uh, maybe it could broken mm -hmm. or it will degrade in the future. So having the 3D model or digital uh, data of this specimen, you don't need to take this specimen all the time. Mm -hmm. Also, it improves open access actions. That means that we make uh, science accessible to everybody, not only researchers, but also the general public. It preserves our natural heritage with a digital backup. We will see now why this is really important. It add, adds value to the material collections. It also opens new and innovative research fields. We will see later a lot of examples and also improve science outreach with more visual and interactive methods. We will see mm -hmm. a, a few examples later, and maybe you can think of more. But So uh, in relation with the digital backup, maybe you remember from yeah. 2018, I think it was, there was a huge uh, fire in the National Museum of uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Most of the collections were lost, indeed, uh, this is the photo. Uh, I'll, yeah, I it's, cried. It's, I, yeah, I cried too. when I saw the news. I was very upset. Um, just not just for the researchers, because no, they all lost everything that they worked on. 
but what also just for you know like science <laughs> for the community um and this the, i think it's a very powerful picture to see yes. what happens um to an ins institution that like there's nothing it's like rubble it's um i think it was a very i think the first time i experienced to be upset like that is when um there were riots in cairo mm. and there was there were, people broke into the um archaeology museum yes and i visited that a lot because fun fact i almost studied egyptology <laughs> I was a big fan uh, and I have been there with my parents a few times and seen the mummies and like I loved it it's like one of my favorite places um, in Egypt and when like I heard that they broke the mummies faces and things like that like that was like destroyed like broken people just rioted and and, and broke um, basically their their heritage right it's, yes. it's the publics it's theirs and that was the first time I cried <laughs> because of what happened in a museum and when I saw that I obviously it's a different case but mm -hmm. it's like everything is just people lost their jobs right because yes they were, like, the stuff people was going, doing the PhDs also. the PhDs yeah. like I mean I think you know that if you do a PhD that is your life yes, it is okay. your entire life you sacrifice a lot of things um family life mental health <laughs> it was <laughs> case it's just it's, it's it's a very time consuming commitment and if that suddenly is taken away from you 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 end up with nothing and i mean as you can see there like i think it shows how you know it, it really shows your point right like you yes. need to have a backup it's yeah crazy. well at least uh, researchers who visited the museum are helping by providing photos, uh, writing notes, uh, documents they could have when they made those visits. Another important reason why it's important to go to to museums for making research. Yeah. But yeah, maybe in the future, if something like that uh, happens, at least we we can have the digital information. So that is uh, one of the points of uh, making these digital copies. Mm -hmm. And also, because as, as I said, uh, this helps by making science more accessible to everybody, as I said, for public, but also researchers. Because imagine that you live in the USA, for example, and you are a PhD without a, um, a budget. Well, maybe in the USA is not the case, but <laughs> from another country that mm -hmm. has more difficulties for getting funded for your projects. Uh, maybe if you need a, an a specimen to look for an specimen in Germany, you can ask the curator or the, the person in charge of the digital collection and they can send you the digital copy so you can continue with your research. Mm -hmm. So this is indeed a really good idea for keeping science going. Yeah, and I think not just um, if you don't have the budgets, something that I think about more and more and during the pandemic is that some people don't get visas ah, yeah, true. to travel to certain countries. Um, just like I have a friend from Mexico City and she couldn't go to the US for a conference. She couldn't go to the US like because it's difficult to get yeah. um, permits to travel uh, into the country. And if your research depends on it and mm -hmm. you don't get a visa because borders are stupid <laughs> in that sense, then um, that can like save your, yes. your PhD, right? I think we might have a question in the chat. I just ah, yes. saw. Can you um, go yes. up and click on chat? Wait, yeah, I you can always find um, ask questions and we'll help to, to... Oh, do you oh from YouTube, yes. So the question from YouTube is, how do you uh, motivate yourself and your team doing long excavations and uh, how long Digitization. Well, how long are the sessions if you digitalize something? I think maybe you can answer the first one because mm -hmm. I I'm always part of the team in the excavations. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not the people leading it, but it's true that I I think I'm more a computer person that in the excavations I don't enjoy as much as other people. So I'm usually oh, the one it. that needs. Yeah, <laughs> I'm usually the one that needs to be. Um, 
motivating. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can share your experience with the first oh, one. Oh, I can, I can. Because I've been um, part of an excavation team just as a volunteer. Mm -hmm. And also actually for the museum, we went to the Tristan dig, dig site. Yeah, that was amazing. I saw was, the photos. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> yes. And I was actually just one of the two paleontologists. So we, together with Heinrich, ah, yeah. <laughs> um, I led the, like I was leading the excavation. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, uh, motivating people, it, de it depends, right? So when I did my first one as a student, you work, all, you work from the sun goes up until the sun goes down, like six days a week. Like we had one day off. Wow. And during that time, we had town day where we got supplies like food. And sometimes we would go shopping or something. But really, you work six days a week. But the, if you get along well with your team and you have someone who makes it fun, then um, it's kind of like, you know, being at camp. I don't know ah, if, yes. if you have ever been at summer camp, but yes. um, you're out there, you're in the dirt. I mean, you could, you can't take a shower every day because there's not enough water, but no one cares. <laughs> We're all dirty. But I remember we listened to a lot of podcasts and like audiobooks. Mm. So we had them on speakers and we actually listened to like quite a lot of funny ones. So we had... Um, these like really funny moments because we'd all like sit there and work and then laugh together even though no one had spoken in maybe like two hours because we were focused and um sometimes you would have movie nights and sit in the trailer <laughs> so it's a lot about also having these personal connections yes I agree on that yeah and yes. so it's a personal connection it's a lot of um and I was lucky there were um a lot of women on my team that's not mm -hmm. always the case no um but it was also led by a woman and with the one at the museum we didn't go for as long but um the team was very very um I was the youngest one <laughs> and I was the one bossing all the men around I loved it <laughs> I was like you do that you do that and then um I mean a camera team was there so later on I saw how they were like what are we going to do now? Like, and I was already gone, you know, like they were very um, funny guys, like part of the, ex of the exhibition team, you know, and um, just don't take yourself too seriously. And I think always be open for questions. Yeah. Like in the beginning, I was a student and I had never done field work except for like field trips at university. And I would ask so many questions because I was like, what is that? What is that? How do I, how do I know what bone that is? Because sometimes it just looks like nothing. And they always said, if you can't identify it, it's a rib. <laughs> like there was all a joke. Joe would always be like, I found the rib, I think. <laughs> and um, sometimes it wouldn't be, but sometimes it was a rib. And I was like, well, I knew that. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Just um, also doing fun things together when you're not working. That was the fun, some of my favorite memories. I had um, the 4th of July with Jack Horner. Mm. And that was like my most embarrassing moment. Um, I don't know if you've seen Dirty Dancing where she carries a yes. watermelon and she's getting introduced and she's like, I carried a watermelon, you know? And someone was like, you need to meet Jack Horner. Like you need to meet him. Like that's a big deal. And I kept like helping to get the camp ready for all the other paleontologists who came to us from yes. all over and I remember holding like 20 rolls of toilet paper oh and someone was like you need to meet this girl who came all the way from Germany and I was just no like way. but I'm holding all these toilet rolls, <laughs> toilet rolls and he was like ah so you the one that came all the way from Germany to do field work and I was like hey yes. that is me <laughs> I would shake your hand but I'm having like a toilet thing happening <laughs> I was just like so embarrassed and he won't uh, forget that no he you. remembered my name oh a year later yeah <laughs> I moved I moved for studying and he's like you that girl from Germany it's like the yes. toilet paper girl um yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was not my my most proud moment but he remembered me so <laughs> he's like you that girl he didn't say the toilet thing luckily he like remembered you. that he was impressed I came all the way from Europe. So that was great. Yes. But field work has always been my favorite. Like you sit there, you actually find something you've never, no one's ever seen before. So I think motivating someone be like, yo, you're the first one mm -hmm. who's seen this dead thing in that like 60, 66 million years ago. You know, it's, um, so that was great. 
just rem reminding people like you doing it like you're here it's because sometimes I sat there very shocked so I was like okay I found my first bone because the first week I found nothing and then I just sat there like this like oh my god <laughs> oh my god it's real <laughs> of course I knew it's real don't try to break it <laughs> I was just sat there in shock because I had found a bone a real in real life I was just I yeah just I remember that feeling too shocked <laughs> yeah but yeah that is like if you motivated yourself mm. and you're excited I think people are going to be excited with you that is my experience that people get swept away by also your excitement they're like yeah yeah so. I think that is important the team feeling that you are not alone uh, also that if you have questions you mm -hmm. can answer you can ask them directly no bad feelings from other I mean it's like yeah in relation with the sessions of digitizing is more or less the same I mean I think it's even more boring uh, digitizing a bone not for me I mean I must you say, love yeah, it <laughs> I mean uh, I can be in the field for a, a lot of hours but I know that my brain says okay this is your your threshold you mm -hmm. need to do something different right now but yeah I think it's more or less the same with all things that you do in your current life uh, in the, your daily daily work life no so when you find that you have reached this threshold that it could be for people lower or higher try to make a rest don't worry you have more days normally no, <laughs> for sure, doing you. but yeah but it's a lot of the same right you like mm -hmm. I mean, you'll go into it, so I'm not gonna, but um, you, there's a lot of the same process again yes. and again. Yeah, that's a problem. Something... That is very repetitive. But I think that, yeah, results are the one that motivates the people for mm -hmm. working. So in this case, finding a bone, especially if, if it's huge or if it's articulated, is going to motivate more the people. Yeah, I know this is more difficult to have in the field, especially <laughs> if you don't find anything. But in the case of digitization, if you find yourself that you have been scanning for a lot of time or if you have been making a lot of photos, okay, there's no problem. You can make a stop here and go to the computer. And then mm -hmm. in the computer, play a little bit to get the 3D model. So when you have the 3D model, oh, it looks really nice. It it's works. amazing. <laughs> it works. So yeah. now you are again excited for going again to the um, bone cellar and digitize more bones. So yeah, yeah. I think this um, is a little stops between activities are the ones that uh, helps uh, doing repetitive things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think there's another question. Or... No, I think that's it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm going to close if I find the mouse. Yeah. But I don't click. know where... Hi. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Right. Okay. Again, in the presentation. Cool illustrations, by the way. Oh, I like how you. they move. <laughs> <laughs> so again, well, I can go uh, because I imagine Frederick uh, spoke about that in the on the other talk. All right. Uh, yeah, hmm. this is a disco the, in relation with the digitization of the natural history institutions. That in Europe, this project is yeah trying to look for this unification of all the digitization processes in the in all the museums in Europe, or at least the ones that are in this project right now. And this is also really important because they are trying to make each uh, digital data that uh, we create as a fair object. That mm -hmm. means that it must uh, be easily findable, accessible to everybody, interoperable, I mean, and reusable in different softwares, for example, or by different people, depending on the projects they are, they are doing. Um, so you can get an image of what is a digital specimen, because maybe it's a little bit difficult to imagine. A digital specimen is not a 3D model, at least speaking in, yeah, in this natural history uh, context. So imagine you have, like in this case, this uh, cyber box or cyber space, and you put there all the digital information you can obtain from a specimen of a museum. No? Like, for example, the DNA sequences, photos, the 3D models, uh, biogeographical information. You can put all this information there. And this box uh, reflects the importance of the physical specimen, but also in connection with all the knowledge that we can gain mm -hmm. from it and from the digital information we are having. That is why 
uh, this digital specimen provides more information than the physical one. We are having there in this box a lot of uh, data that we don't have only with the physical mm -hmm. specimen. Um, or the fonts here, I have it uh, differently in my computer, but there's no problem. I mean, te technology, right? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the, the point is that I, I also work with technology, so this is a little bit... <laughs> <laughs> Plan for the future. It just makes yeah. the future more visible. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Let's say it like that. Um, yeah, as I, as I said, uh, Frederick already speak that, uh, spoke about that, the importance of the digitization plans in the, in the Museum für Naturkunde, and all, how can we mass digitize all the specimens, like for example, the Imenoptera, the insects, uh, are easier, easier to digitize than, for example, the dinosaur bones mm -hmm. that we will see, because for example, this is an old device, well, not, not old, but it's a previous device that was uh, being used in the museum for digitizing the small specimens. But if we have large specimens and we want to digitize it in 3D, we are going to have more problems. Because, They're big. <laughs> yeah, they are indeed really big. So we cannot put them in, in tiny boxes and put them in the machine so the, we can digitize them. So we, can, we need to look for another types of uh, techniques. In this case, I'm going to speak only about 3D techniques mm -hmm. because uh, we have also 2D techniques for making photos and everything. And um, yeah, depending on, on a lot of things, we are going to need to choose between one technique or another. Because for example, in these photos, uh, the specimens that we have, the mouse can be seen. Well, I have problems with the mouse here. <laughs> but for example, these vertebrae are from a um, tiny sauropod from Transylvania that are something like that. I mm. mean, they are really small. But this one that is in the bone cellar here at the Museum for Naturkunde is huge. It's in a really huge cage. And I, I don't remember, it was something like that. Really so it's huge. a vertebrate from the back, right? Like uh, back. No, it was a cervical one. Cervical. It, it's, it's from the neck. From the neck. But, so you can imagine how large is this animal. Yeah. So, <laughs> Um, yeah, we are not going to use the same techniques depending on the external features of these specimens. I mean, for, we will see, for example, this huge vertebra, we cannot scan it easily with mm -hmm. a CT scanner. Or even for, move it easily, right? Or so move it, heavy. yeah. <laughs> so indeed, we are waiting for some movements in the, in the collection for getting to digitize this vertebra mm -hmm. because it's... We need several people to move it. So yeah. yeah, it's really difficult. Also, it's important the user's expertise when digitizing a specimen. You are not going to use one technique or another. Yeah, depending if you don't have experience on that, maybe it's easier that you go for one. I'm not going to say that one is easier than mm -hmm. other, but. Um, and also, yeah, this is really important, especially for the institutions, the, the, this ratio between the budget and time. For when do you need the specimen digitized and how much is it going to cost? Mm -hmm. So we need to take that also keep it in mind. For example, I'm going to go fast through these uh, slides but if you anybody wants to know more about them then in the question we i can go back mm -hmm. again so we have the x-ray computed tomography scanner the ct scan that is really nice especially if you want to look for the internal structures of a specimen like for example in this case this is a skull of a sauropod as always <laughs> as always <laughs> always a sauropod uh, and here we have the reconstruction of the of the brain and the inner ear so it's really nice if you want to see these structures without having to break the bone or having to put some liquid inside or material for make um, a mold a like yeah, a cast, a mold, right? yeah. Yeah. So for that, uh, as I said, we have different uh, CT scans like uh, the micro CTs or the nano microtomographs or the synchrotron that are really nice because, because they have a lot of resolution, but we can only work with that with the small specimens. Yeah. So yeah, as I told you, if we have this really huge vertebra, we cannot use it, uh, we cannot scan it in a normal micro CT. Mm -hmm. You need to go, for example, into a medical scanner, veterinary scanner. So yeah, this huge one. And the problem is that these scanners are made for 
uh, scanning people. So the, um, the power of the rays is uh, not the same as the other ones, mm -hmm. it's lower. So we won't obtain normally the same results for the day. It's also not as clear, right? Yeah. Like the, the you images have like more, fuzzy. more noise. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, that is why it's a little bit difficult with uh, larger specimens. But if you only want to, to get the surface of the specimen, you don't need the mm -hmm. internal structures. You can go, for example, with the laser, laser scanners. That the thing is that the, you have a laser here that projects a line or a, or a point, a laser point mm -hmm. in the surface of your specimen, and then a sensor uh, by something math, of maths. <laughs> they make a, a reconstruction then in the computer. And as I said, uh, this uh, works with laser, but also you can have uh, with a similar, uh, more or less similar uh, structure, mm -hmm. the structured light 3, 3D scanner, but instead this one doesn't use laser, it goes with a uh, light All that right. could be uh, white or blue. Oh, it's so like um, a handhold one. Yes, oh. this is a handhold. I mean, cool. this is, you take it with your hand and you have different techniques. I mean, that depends on the person. Mm -hmm. No, you can put it in the round table, this one. Oh, and it spins? Yeah, right. and it spins and you can be like that and just spin the, like a DJ. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you <laughs> like can move DJ. it. Yes. <laughs> and then as you can see in the computer, you get a, it's, First is a draft. I mean, you need to clean it later, but mm -hmm. it's really fast. I mean, in less than an hour, you can get a 3D model uh, of a really complex uh, specimen. Cool. Yes. Um, and another way of doing it is that you can be the one that is moving mm -hmm, in, mm -hmm. uh, instead of the specimen. Especially, this is important with fragile specimens or really huge ones. And this is uh, the example. That's of how it turns out. Yeah. So good. Yeah, I'm really proud of this one. Oh, you, you, you did it. <laughs> you nice. Did. Okay. So. I really like it. <laughs> um, the technique that is uh, mostly used uh, right now is photogrammetry because it's really, really accessible. Mm -hmm. And you don't need to have uh, uh, the latest uh, camera equipment in, in the market for doing it. Indeed, there are people who are doing really nice uh, photogrammetric models with uh, smartphones. Mm -hmm. I mean, you cannot use the low. Of course, you need a high, and, like a high. Yeah, setting, let's yeah. say middle to high, but you can you can get the 3D models by doing photogrammetry with the smartphones. And the idea is more or less the same as the scanner, more or less. I mean, you put the, the object and then you need to do photographs around it and trying to, to get a, an overlap of all the photos mm -hmm. because later with the software, you are going to upload all, all the images here. As you can see, the blue boxes, uh, the blue square, squares are the photos. And the program is going to align these photos and make, in the end, a 3D model. And this 3D model, you can have it like that, like a mesh. Like a mesh. It's called, <laughs> yeah, it's, called, it's a, a mesh, but it, it's a S. I, I cannot pronounce it like a Oh, right. Mesh, so it's not a mesh. It's a... Yeah. <laughs> S8. I mean, it looks a mess. <laughs> no, but luckily this one, yeah, I, I got a lot of me, mesh meshes, mesh meshes, but this one it was, was nice. <laughs> but it's cool because I've done it for this class mm. and um, some of the software is like free that yes. you can use now. And so anybody could, if you want to digitalize this Christmas tree, you could, you could because the, the program recognizes right the overlap yes it, it's like sees this this like little bubble here and then it'll recognize it in all the pictures mm -hmm. it, when i first did it i was just sat there again in shock i was like how <laughs> so it's cool. magic so thanks cool. to the computer engineers <laughs> yeah so <laughs> cool <laughs> so yeah and, and as i said this is a together with the instructor light 3d scanner uh, you can obtain uh, the texture of the specimen. Mm, and color and everything. Right? Yes. A lot of information there. So it's really nice. Um, and yeah, well, this is the one of the examples, as you can see. Wow, it's shiny. Easy. No, but it's not shiny in reality. I don't know why. I mean, <laughs> it looks <laughs> great. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I like shiny things. So, so, yeah. so for me, it I looks mean, great. Sometimes when fossils have been... Um, so, so 
sometimes I walk around in the exhibition. I mean, it's not like I'm there every day, but for Berlin Science Week, for example, mm -hmm. someone uh, came and said, can you point out what the real the bones yes. are and what the casts are? And I said, you know, there you can, like I showed them how to see the difference. And the casts are usually more matte. And when it, where it has been preparated and like, you know, glued and stuff, it's sometimes shiny. Like it, you can see the difference. Yes. So sometimes it is shiny. Yes, I must true. say. Or like, not like sparkly, of course, but it's like shiny, you know, I like it. Now that you have said something about the preparation in, in bones, I think it's also interesting for those who want to go to the museums and try to check, yeah, which bones have been prepared or mm -hmm. not. Uh, generally, a good preparation um, shows the parts that have been uh, created from scratch or have been, yeah, if it was broken, it was glued. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that is, I was going to say it's not artistic. Yeah, indeed, it's, it's art. But the point of a preparator is not making the bone again perfect. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you need to, to make the bone to be the part that have been preserved the best as possible. But try not to, to overdo the yeah. parts that have been made from scratch. So you yeah. can, as, as researcher mainly, because maybe you can have a, you, you are visiting the institution again and they put this bone and they say, okay, I knew this bone was broken and now it's complete again, but I don't see the parts that have been uh, prepared. Yeah, and... if it's too perfect, it's not that yeah. great. <laughs> and that is a problem when you want to compare this bone or make phylogenetic analysis and score the characters because maybe there are some places that have been created from zero and mm -hmm. were not like that in the original mm -hmm. specimen. So, for example, I think here in the museum, they do this really nice yeah. because if you see the, the specimens, the uh, mounted skeletons in the exhibition, you can see pretty easy the parts that have been that have been created from yeah. scratch. And I think if you important. know what you're looking yeah. for, I think once you point it out, people are like, I can see it. Yes. Yeah, so it's nice. It looks very cohesive and nice. But when you go closer and you pay more attention, mm -hmm. you can see what's there and what's not. <laughs> Yeah, totally. Which I think it's good. Yeah, yeah. But I like I said, I just think it looks nice and shiny. Yes, yeah. <laughs> compact. Um. Oh well, here we Perfect. have uh, Heinrich. That's Heinrich <laughs> again. Yeah. And um, also, this is really interesting because uh, with uh, photogrammetry and also, although it's a little bit more difficult with uh, scanners, you can digitize the large specimens or even mounted the skeletons, like uh, the ones that we have in the. In the main hall. So. Oh, he's holding a camera. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. He he was doing as always. <laughs> yeah, and as you can see here, there is a, a scale bar he put later for making easier the scaling the scaling of the of the model in the in the computer. So yeah, uh, I remember those days. Uh, he together with um, Matteo Belvedere and Bernard Surian, that he is also working here at the museum, making photos on Mondays because mm -hmm. the museum is closed, closed on Mondays. Yeah. With this, uh, I don't know the name, this machine, I know in Spanish, but uh, you can, uh, they usually use it for cutting trees also, that, it, it, that elevator. Oh, like the, oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Like It's like an automated, yes. like, lift. Yes. Like, yes. A, almost like a crane, right? Yes. Like the lift, yeah. And they they were doing the, the photos like that in the crane, going around the so specimens. Cool. Like, Whoa. <laughs> but it was really nice. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, uh, he has been working in the models, and they they look, although he, he needs to, to work a little bit more on some of them, at least the last news I had they look really nice. Mm -hmm. So yeah, when you have experience, you can do a lot of really nice things with photogrammetry. Yeah. And this is also a little bit of publishing. <laughs> <laughs> you want to but, advertise. What's yeah, advertising, <laughs> yes. Because uh, for those who are researchers to paleontologists, uh, we have created the dry, the dry, free <laughs> pal group. Uh, because as you may imagine, yeah, as uh, these digital technologies are really accessible to everybody, there's a lot of people doing 3D models all around the planet. And most of the times it doesn't matter the quality of the 3D models they are doing 
or the things they are doing with these 3D models. So we are trying to, well, this has been properly addressed a, a few times in the past, in the last years, but there are still some uh, ethics and best practice uh, actions that needs to be taken. And in this group, we are discussing these kind of things, trying to look for some guidelines in the future. And for example, we have uh, some really nice examples uh, like this one. You don't need to read it. I mean, uh, for example, in, in, in Switzerland, there was this fossil track of dinosaurs, mm -hmm. theropods, that was found, but uh, in the excavation disappeared. I don't know the exact thing or what happened, no, but luckily before that, um, a lot of uh, photos, uh, information were taken, also 3D models, not only with photogrammetry, also with scanners. Um, yeah, they made also plaster copies, 3D printed copies. So there's a lot of digital information, also physical, new physical information that has made possible that although we don't have uh, these physical tracks anymore, at least we have the digital information that uh, was uh, recovered before this, uh, this uh, disappeared. Another uh, case was this, this is worse, I think, because um, you can imagine this- Stolen. Uh, yeah, it was stolen. It was, uh, this uh, was a crocodile that was uh, described in 2002. As you can see, the drawings are not perfect. The, the most uh, important features are difficult to see, but uh, luckily a CT scan was made and we have a lot of uh, important information of the specimen, but soon after that, the school was stolen. So we don't have this school anymore, uh, but at least again, we have the digital information and we still can research on it and, yeah, and we are crossing our fingers that maybe in the future we can recover this specimen, but. I think what not many people know, not that I mean, not that theft happens a lot, but like vandalism yeah. uh, of dig sites. Like I, I don't think, I can think of any like German cases, but in no. the US. Well, in Spain, we have a lot too. Yeah, it's like when people um, at the trespass or like they know it's there or they don't and they just happen to come across it. Um, and again, in, in the US, most of the land um, also where fossils are found as private land like by yeah. farmers, for example. So if people come to this land, that is trespassing. So they're already breaking the law. And if they then also destroy like tracks or fossils or, you know, steal mm. stuff, that will be lost forever. So um, it's, it's just sad. Like every yeah. now and then I see like see it in the news or something. I'm like, what are these people doing? It's just because I think they don't know how valuable it is. They just think like, oh, cool. cool. Like I, sometimes I don't even know if they know that it's like a paleontology. Yeah, maybe, thing. but if they know they are valued too, maybe they try to sold it to the best. Or that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> who knows like who knows yeah i don't know uh, they're so strange cases so yeah yeah there are bad people everywhere <laughs> <laughs> yeah in every field and another interesting example of this uh, use of digital technologies uh, is for example what happens with the born digital specimens that imagine that you have a cropolite that, uh, oh, you got to tell people what that is. <laughs> well, I, I don't have a much vocabulary in English for saying that. Excrement, can we say? Droppings. Dro Dro droppings? Yeah, also. droppings. <laughs> so, okay. um, yeah, I found dinosaur poop. Dinosaur poop. Yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah, so dro dinosaur excrements. Or other people. Yeah, for my case, dinosaur. Okay, yeah. So in this case, It looks poop. funny. Yeah. <laughs> So imagine that you want to know what is inside this poop. So you can go and use your CT scan. And using the CT scan, you find a new specimen of something. Mm -hmm. I, for example, a fish, an insect, or even bones of a new dinosaur or a tiny dinosaur, whatever. Um, you couldn't uh, get to know this information unless you broke this uh, yeah. poop. So. Yeah. By doing these digitizations, you are conserving, preserving the poop. <laughs> <laughs> I 
<laughs> but also you are getting to know the information that is inside it. Science, yeah. So this is really interesting uh, for future analysis that maybe you have your institution has a huge poop collection. <laughs> <laughs> How often does this happen? Like I've this... seen dinosaur poop or dinosaur droppings. Uh, doing field work and of course everybody's always like look ha, 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 you know like it's, yeah. we're all immature and it's i mean we're, we're just normal people right if you find that it's always kind of like a funny yes scenario okay. I mean, because that's just all of us i think <laughs> yeah but i've never thought about putting them in a ct scan mm -hmm. you know so but of course so what there's, it, there's like fish fish in there or like yeah. scales no the, in this case it, yes it's a fish you have the scales. I think it's not a, and it was not a new specimen. Uh -huh. I need to look for it. I mean, I'm not a specialist, a specialist on fish. A fish Fishes. are crazy, no? Like, yeah, I know well, people work on fish, and fish people are very like, fish is the best. Like, they just love yeah, I, fish. I mean, they are really nice. I remember of course, I, but... having an ichthyology, paleoichthyology class in my master's, and I was amazed. I mean, all the tiny bones that uh, yeah. and teeth. And teeth. They have yes. I mean, I worked on teeth. They have insane teeth. Like, fish is just too it much is. for me. Like, I'm gonna stick with dinosaurs. Fish are, fish are like, and fish paleontologists, I'm just saying, they're very like, fish are much better than dinosaurs. The ones I met, they're friendly, but yes. they're very dedicated to fish. I mean, uh, everybody is going to say that the fish feel is the best. So, <laughs> yes, <laughs> good point. So, yeah, fishes are nice too. Yeah. They are really fine. Yes. Yes. <laughs> No, it's now the people who are watching who work on fish, we are like gain some points by <laughs> saying that fish is good. Um, and again, we have seen some examples of what can, can we do with these uh, digital technologies, no? But there are a lot more examples. Like we say, if we use the CD scans, we can get to know the internal structure of a of a specimen, like in this case, the brain. This is another example. This is the skull of a it was a shoe. I think it was, yeah, the, the so one of the, from, from the museum. museum. Yeah. And they made a CD scan. And with the CD scan, as you can see, you can see the internal structures of mm. the of the bone. Mm. Like in this case, the brain. They are focusing now the, yes, Ooh. in the reconstruction of the brain. This uh, Wittmer lab, they're quite um, like good in doing outreach. I think they have all these like cool videos mm. and um, yeah. Yes. Very cool. And this is also really important because uh, with this information, you can also study some uh, behavioral uh, components of the animal, for mm -hmm. example, uh, because, uh, well, I'm not a specialist on, on brains, on neurology, but uh, indeed, uh, this morphology can indicate a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Because you like we know where parts of the brain is like where, what is responsible for what right like what yes. sense sometimes right like that's at least how how I know it. Um, so if you can look and compare the brain, mm. you know of, of course I mean the more information you have, the more you're gonna understand yes, totally. this thing that's no longer alive. But and there is indeed phylogenetic analysis on these uh, 3D reconstructions of the brain, depending oh. on the morphology of each uh, part of the brain, yeah. the nerves and everything. So it's cool. Yeah, indeed, when you put together all the little pieces that you are you find, you can get to know better these, these animals. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that maybe you can explain this one. Oh, better. God. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you can see my name at the bottom. <laughs> but that is a paper um, we published a few years ago um, together with my supervisor at the time. Um, we actually have like a little bit, I don't know if the people, um, ah, yes, we're too. quite small now, but um, I also worked with um, CT scans. So I worked on Tristan T-Rex that we had at the museum. It's going to come back. Don't worry, guys. Um, it's in Copenhagen right now, but it was in our exhibition for quite a long time. And I, of course, could, couldn't go into the exhibition every day and take part of the jaw or whatever I wanted to look at. So I sat in front of the computer for hours and hours looking at CT scans that were obtained at the Charité. So we actually took them oh, yeah. to the Charité, um, like at the weekends, sometimes they scan fossils and not people. <laughs> but yeah, we, um, 
got these really pretty good images. Like I've worked on much worse ones from seropods. <laughs> so these were like a luxury because you can see what's inside. And I looked at the replacement rates because dinosaurs replaced their teeth throughout their entire lives and some quicker than others. So sauropods a bit quicker than T-Rex, but I think it's cool. You can see without damaging the specimen what's inside. So you can see in some of the images where there is another tooth growing into For example, a tooth. Yeah, one? Um, slowly pushing out that tooth. So they didn't have roots like we do. Mm -hmm. um, they were more like hollow. So if you imagine like street cones <laughs> stacked. So sometimes sauropods had up to four teeth, right? I mean, you probably also know better than I do. <laughs> and um, But T-Rex had um, just like one replacement tooth at the time. T takes a few years to form and come out. But that is only, I could only do that because I had the images. Yeah. Like otherwise I could have not done this work. And it was super exciting because it was the first T-Rex we had in Europe. So it's the first time it was done here. Like we looked at these CT images and that was super exciting. Like it got a lot of press, of course. Yeah, um, indeed. The, all the advertising of the in the Uban also everywhere. It was, yeah, yeah. It, it was a, how was the the name of the exhibit? Uh, T-Rex Psych der Sane. Oh, oh no. um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Berlin Psych Sane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it was like a big campaign. I remember. I'm also a first uh, generation scientist, and my I... my parents are very supportive, but they're not scientists. And sometimes when they see stuff that science, they're like, oh. I don't understand it. And sometimes when I would try in the very beginning of my career, I would try to tell them what I'm doing. And they're like, oh God, I don't get it. Okay, it's dinosaurs. <laughs> but then um, this happened and it was in the press and my, suddenly my parents were very invested <laughs> because it was like in the newspapers and stuff. But I think it was very cool because T-Rex, like this dinosaur brought a lot of publicity, not just mm -hmm. to the museum, but also to what's possible with modern tech technique right and that paleontologists don't just sit and dig in the dirt <laughs> but also that we do a lot of stuff with the computer so all my work was done at the computer like yeah. yours um i mean of course sometimes they with the images we had we can not I mean personally but the museum could make a nice cast <laughs> so we can put it here and make it look nice but yeah that was really cool and the software i used was like software that was also freely available mm, for cool. Mac computers. It's called Osirix and I already used it for ah, my yeah, batteries. Yes, oh yeah, yes. <laughs> of course we do. And um, like it's, it wasn't very difficult to use, um, but I already knew how to do that since my batteries, but no one taught me. I was just, it was like learning by doing. And uh, I had many um, nights where I just said, like, what, what is this? What am I looking at? <laughs> but <laughs> after, like after a while, you... It's like, like everything, right? You um, get more experience. But yeah, that was a really fun um, and we published that. Um, and it's also like the, the images are available online. So yeah, it's pretty cool. And indeed, I think this is also really important because you publish them in uh, this uh, project in um, open a journal, I um, think. The, no? the, the journal is not open, but the data oh. is available. Oh, okay, okay. So, um, but the yeah. point is that at least all the people can access this information. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. People can um, download all the images and. Um, cool. Yeah. That that is that that was quite important for me that mm. that's um, accessible for everybody because science also has to be reproducible. Yes. So if you um, it, it it helps no one if you try to <laughs> hoard <laughs> the data like it makes no sense. Totally. Yeah. So what else? Ah, more things that we can do with the 3D models. Like for example, as we said at the beginning, we don't usually find the bones like in perfect connection, articulation, perfect shape. So they could be deformed somehow, and we can try to reconstruct them digitally again to its original form mm -hmm. using some computer softwares and everything. So this is really, really interesting too. And I know uh, several teams that are working on this right now, so we get more uh, detailed and accurate reconstructions of how these fossils were uh, at the beginning mm -hmm. in life. 
And also, I really like this example because this is from Matteo, also a, a paper he he published with together with a, a team in 2017, uh, in which uh, you have this track site in a mountain. Maybe it's difficult to say. I mean, it's Switzerland or Italy. I don't remember. Pelmo, maybe it's Italian. Italian. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> sounds Italian. Isn't he also from Italy? He's from Italy, no? Yes. Yeah. And there was this track site in this mountain, like it was like three, three kilometers. Yeah. In the, um, yeah, I think you needed to go there by helicopter or yeah. something like that. So imagine if you need, like in your excavation, that you need to go there every day and, yeah. and snowy and everything. So, okay, maybe we can do a 3D model and we can take it to our lab cool. and then we can do oral analysis and studies from there. So. This is really interesting in this kind of situations, but also uh, in the sites, uh, if you want to produce a 3D map of how you found all the bones, it, it's also really useful yeah. using these digital technologies. It's not the same as the machine that Alan Grant had for, <laughs> for getting to know the, the fossils, but yeah, these digital methods are really useful in the, this is in the field. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> this is better. And also, they are really nice, these say digital methods for biomechanics and 3D reconstruction. I will tell you a little bit more about this because this is indeed my current project. And the one I also developed a little bit in one of my uh, postdocs. Mm -hmm. So I, I take in again. Um, this is really interesting because maybe you've heard that uh, dinosaurs were thought to be this the uh, wait i have the name in german what is this it's no it's low <laughs> it's low it's low oh, okay, animals yeah. uh, with the tails dropping yeah, in the, yeah. and really dumb mm -hmm. we can say uh but this is not the case as you maybe you all know now as you have seen in the movies and, and documentaries because indeed, I forgot to say that these movies and documentaries are based on the work that uh, paleontologists are doing. Mm -hmm. I imagine you you can uh, connect the points, the dots. So in my project, uh, we are going to try this um, hypothesis that uh, digitally, that uh, these uh, animals, in this case, sauropods, uh, did have the tails in a more horizontal position um, oh, this is a very old postcard. Yeah, <laughs> yeah indeed. Uh, this was Jarafatitan uh, uh, until 2007, I think mm. it was. So, yeah, at this point, we already know, scientists already know, because I, I was doing my university degree <laughs> still. Mm -hmm. uh, paleontologists uh, did know, but uh, not with these digital technologies that sauropods or generally speaking dinosaurs didn't have this tail like in a drop uh, way um, that is why in 2000, yeah <laughs> that is why in 2007 uh, with this renovation of the building and everything they put uh, the dinosaurs in a new position no let's just say with the tails a little bit more uh, up dynamic uh, right like yeah, yeah more dynamic true um, yeah, but the point is that we need to test somehow that this is real, no? And for that, I am working by doing these 3D models of the vertebrae, in this case of the tail, and putting them together one by one in the, in the computer. And well, I'm going to explain this later. Mm -hmm. And putting them uh, in the computer and then testing uh, how they moved, uh, the muscles, where they were, how they were, and everything. And you may think that this is in the next slide, you may think, how are you going to know this if you are speaking about extinct animals? Mm -hmm. They don't exist any. Well, we have the birds. Yeah, imagine that we are speaking about the extinct dinosaurs. No, there is no way that we get to know how were the muscles developed or how large they were uh, or how they moved. So for that, uh, there is one thing that we use that is the extant phylogenetic bracket in which, remember, this is a phylogenetic tree. No, we have the relationship between the species. And here you have uh, these animals that are extinct. But then we have the crocodiles and the birds 
that are still living. So for that, we are making like a bracket between these extinct species. And using this, we can use the ways uh, these animals move or the ways uh, the, the muscles, the, the anatomical features of birds and crocodiles for trying to suggest, hypothesize how these extinct animals moved, but also the how were these um, uh, soft tissues? Mm -hmm. Because yeah, as I told, it's not normal that you have preserved uh, muscles preserved. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Doing, so, doing when I first started working here, we I helped dissect the crocodile. Oh yes. Like twice actually. Oh, that's and, cool. Um, with with Daniela and. I was very like, oh my gosh, <laughs> at the beginning, because quite big, no? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they like just uh, died of old age <laughs> at the um, at the zoo, and the museum works, um, you know, together with other institutions. So we got it, and I remember her taking the muscles that we took from the crocodile and like measuring them, weighing them, and so you, that was really cool because you could see how new techniques or like you know like with with alive animals or like deceased animals can use can be used yes. for for research um, that's extinct animals that was really cool also like my first year here it's like oh my god i can see how like this works now because i also asked myself like how do people model stuff like how does this work um so it was cool to see in real life yeah. oh wow i didn't have the, this experience yet I hope in the future you need but... to talk to her yeah. <laughs> maybe you'll get your hands on a crocodile i mean yeah, i was I mostly know. taking notes because i was too scared to just like cut stuff. yeah me too so i was just like no you do that so everything is okay and i'll help <laughs> so but i was there taking pictures and um, weighing stuff but yeah that's cool yeah I oh, we have a question hope. maybe it's a oh, question yes. about um i hope nothing too difficult. Nothing too difficult. <laughs> we have another um, question from YouTube, and someone's asking, could you print your digital data models with a 3D printer, and how much would it cost for like a Graffa Titan? So, you know, the ones that it's really big at the museum. I mean, uh, that depends, right? How much it would cost? I don't have an idea on that. For example, a, an, a PhD... It must be student. a big printer. <laughs> yeah, no, but... It, I think there are large print, 3D printers, yeah. but I mean, for example, uh, there is a, this PhD student also from Daniela Svars that is working here also with digital techniques. She's digitizing the Dicreosaurus material, another sauropod, <laughs> and she has been scanning uh, the dorsals and cervicals ones, I think. Um, she bought a, a 3D printer. She, right. she has it in so her home. So you can 3D yeah. print it then? Yeah. I mean, uh, if you buy a normal 3D printer, you can have like bones like this size, I think. Yeah. But yeah, if you want to digitize the large ones, maybe it's you need to go to an, a company that works with this kind of things, because if not, you're you going to You probably also scale it down, right? If you want to make yes. your model. <laughs> Yes, of course. I mean, you can have it as a keychain also. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, so yes, you can print it. Yeah, and, print it. yeah, and depending on the quality, it won't be really expensive. But yeah, if you want to have a high quality one, maybe you need to put a little bit more money. Yeah. But yeah, again, that depends on the projects that in this case, for example, the museum could have in mind for buying a large 3d printer because if it's going to be only for several specimens it's, it's not worth mm -hmm. it and yeah i think this answers the first question also that yeah indeed you can 3d print <laughs> a 3d model of course this is important that you take a look at your mesh mesh <laughs> because maybe in the process of uh, doing the 3d model you can get some errors and this could make the 3D printer, printer go crazy and print Difficult, strange yeah. things. So uh, you need to, to pass the, the 3D model needs to pass like a quality test mm -hmm. before going through the 3D printer. But if not, there should be shouldn't yeah. be any problem. So yeah, the answer is yes. Yeah, and cost, course. we don't know. <laughs> But I, I thought a lot of times about buying a 3D printer, having at home, but I was told that they make a lot of noise. 
Oh, so, nice. okay. Yeah, but I mean, it doesn't matter. You're going to have a, a scale dinosaur in, in your it's house. Worth if the you want. Like the noise, yeah. yeah. And the mess. <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's really easy. I mean, it's, it's accessible to everybody. That is a, the good point of that. Cool. And also, oh, wait, where am I? You have to click yeah. it. Yeah. There you go. Um, yeah, in relation with the comparison with the extant, with living animals, uh, this is really useful because, for example, if you have the bones, this is the tail of Yarafa Titan. And in different colors, you can see the insertions of the muscles. No, uh, I've uh, taken a look at uh, all these uh, fossils in the bone cellar, looking for these rugosities in the bone, ridges, laminae, and everything that could serve for an insertion of a muscle. Mm -hmm. And this, together with information that we have from extinct, uh, sorry, extant animals, living animals, we can reconstruct later the the muscles of this uh, dinosaur in this case, this sauropod dinosaur. And here is the image that we have uh, before in the presentation, the video, so you can have an idea of how the muscles uh, wrapped the, the bones. And with this information, we can also have, for example, a more approximated, more uh, accurate, uh, information values about the size of the tail in this case, but also the weight. Mm -hmm. And this is really nice, for example, for example, for testing the mathematical methods that were created, equations that were created for checking the mass of uh, extinct animals. So, yeah, as said, as uh, if you have a lot of information for your puzzles, uh, this will get a better idea of what we are studying. We are trying to bring, uh, to, bring to life these animals. So, mm -hmm. so cool. Um, yeah, <laughs> again, this is also something that is really difficult to do with the physical specimen, with the fossils. So imagine if I need to go to the main hall and I say to the curator, to Daniela, Oi, Daniela, I need the vertebrae because I want to play with them, trying to put different uh, positions. <laughs> Let, let's try to look at the ranges of motion of the tail. So, yeah, we are not speaking here about a tiny dinosaur. We are speaking here about a huge one. So you cannot do that with, uh, with the fossils. Mm. So 3D modeling is pretty nice for assessing these kind of things and also for trying, in this case, here at the right, then why I don't see here. Yeah. Uh, with different colors, we have the muscles, but in this case, these are the tendons that are mm. connected the different vertebrae in this case. And with this information, we can go to a specific software and try to reconstruct the, the <sighs> movements of the tail. Cool. This is a dorsal view. Don't take so it too from, seriously. Uh, from, you gotta like what is dorsal? Is it from above or from the side? Or yeah, this is a imagine you have a drone like in the Google Maps and you go from down to up and you see the sauropod from, from above. A... Uh, yeah, but say so don't take it too seriously because <laughs> I was starting with this model, but uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll as you can that. see, we can do pretty nice things with these new techniques. We <laughs> and this is also really helpful. For example, for comparing different the movements of ranges of motion of different species, we have here Yarafa Titan and in the other place Bambera Caudia. Um, and as you can see, the oh, if I have the mouse, it disappeared again. Oh no! <laughs> yeah. Well, imagine in the in the right side Bambera Caudia, it seems to have a, like a larger. Um, a range of motion, especially mm -hmm. at the base of the tail, than the Arafa Titan. That so seems it's more flexible? Be, yeah, more flexible, yeah. yes. And this is really interesting, for example, for studying their uh, behavior. Like, for example, maybe Bambera Caudia could use his, uh, its uh, long tails for communicating within the herd. Mm -hmm. Imagine that, I mean, this is these are hypotheses, no? But imagine these sauropods were in a herd, and they wanted to communicate that, oh, there's a theropod uh, in front of the herd. Let's move herd. the tail. Yeah. So <laughs> it will be easier for animals la, la, like Pambera caudia than for mm -hmm. Yara Fatita. In addition, we can also compare the development of the muscles. And this is also really interesting because, for example, as you can see, Yara Fatitan had like a more massive tail 
than Bambera Caudia. And one hypothesis could be like, he is Bambera Caudia. You can see that these are the typical sauropod, like in an horizontal position with really long necks and long tails. Um, yeah, with these long structures, they that were in an horizontal position, they needed to try to avoid to go against this gravity. Mm -hmm. So they need a, some kind of a stabilization. And for that is really important the epaxial muscles that are the ones that are above. Let's mm -hmm. see, maybe if I go, it's easier to see the ones. Oh, I, the ones that are red, dark red. Uh, the orange and dark uh -huh. red ones. Yeah. These are the epaxial ones, no? So with these muscles more uh, developed, they can maintain this structure, this uh, position, mm -hmm. no? And also you can see here that in this case, as we are speaking about an horizontal position, most of the weight is in the belly. Mm -hmm. And this means that uh, in these animals, well, indeed in animals with uh, long tails, uh, the tail is a really important part for mo moving the hindlings. Mm -hmm. So in this case, as most of the weight is in the belly, uh, they don't need to have really strong epaxial muscles, the ones uh, uh, below. But it's not the case of Yarafatitan. In this case, as you can see, Yarafatitan is like a more oblique, oblique, yes. more yeah, diagonal, diagonal position. And most of the weight is just in front of the hind limb. So mm -hmm. for moving this hind limb, they are going to need more power. And for that, they need in this case, more uh, development of the epaxial muscles, the one below. That means uh, uh, one of them uh, is the caudo femoralis longus. That is the important one for making the propulsion. But imagine that you uh, uh, stretch this muscle, mm -hmm. uh, the tail is going to stretch, all, it's, it's mm -hmm. going to move the tail. So it needs also the other one, the ilioischio caudalis, in the other part of the tail that is going to stretch at the same time for maintaining the tail in a horizontal position. Yeah. So it doesn't move like, <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> like in every the, time, yeah. in the uh, model in the beginning. <laughs> yeah, in this case, the tail is going to stay in the same position because uh, muscles from different, uh, the opposite places are going to stretch mm -hmm. at, the, at the same time. And this also helps in moving the animal. Mm -hmm. Here you have an example of one of the this biomechanical big one. Yeah. Argentinosaurus. This is Argentinosaurus, yeah, from Argentina, <laughs> one of the largest ones. And maybe you find this one <laughs> more fun. Look at the tiny hands. <laughs> <laughs> but this is indeed a really, Love really it. interesting experiment because with this information, the authors uh, <laughs> were, yeah were capable of assessing the highest speeds yeah. at what these uh, T-Rexes could uh, run. And they saw that uh, indeed the largest one is 28 kilometers per hour for the highest stress limit conditions, mm -hmm. meaning that if the T-Rex runs uh, more than, uh, faster than this uh, speed, it will probably break, break their legs. Yeah. So I'm sorry to say that, but probably this scene in Jurassic Park it could not happen. But it could still eat me. I, feel, I don't know how fast I can run. Yes, I'm good at sprinting, but I'm not a marathon runner. I have asthma. <laughs> so no, but, but I mean they, they were in a in a car. So yeah, they maybe if you were running, I don't know. What I don't know how normal... fast I can run. No. I think the normal speed for a, a person is five meters per second. All right, so we but will But I die. mean, you, you will be like a walking. Oh, it's a T-Rex coming. Okay, it doesn't matter. It I doesn't want to matter. Be <laughs> if I just stand, can't see me, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, we have a question. Oh, yes. Maybe it's a question about... Oh, my God, not a difficult one. <laughs> you answered every question perfectly. You're well, always worried. You. So we have another YouTube question. And it said, what's your opinion about the typical pictures seen in paleo art of large sauropods? standing upright on their hind limbs. I know exactly what they're talking about. <laughs> Considering the fused proximal caudal vertebrates. We have an expert here. Oof. Then that is not a, not yeah, a question. No, I was by... thinking about that, okay. Uh, I remember like in, in lots of the art, right? They're always like yes. eating from a tree or something on their hind limbs. Yeah, and they put this uh, tripod uh, posture. Yeah, the tripod posture. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I think there have not been any 
uh, models on that, digital models, mm -hmm. because I do know that there have been some uh, physical studies. Oh, I imagine that depends on the sauropod also. I actually do my bachelor's. I, I, went, yes. not, I didn't go into the modeling, but um, because I also looked at um, sauropod teeth and mm. like how rapidly they replace and stuff and the position of their necks and also tails and that, you know, we, I looked if they are high grazers or, you know, like yes. low grazers. So some of them ate uh, plants more high up because their necks also, you know, um, so there is, is of course a difference of how they eat yeah, and where I they think eat. It's but... more than more related with the length of the necks. Yeah. Than this. I mean, I think there's no need to be in a position like that. Although for very specific moments, yeah. maybe. I mean, it looks but... good in the pictures. Yes. Like I very much enjoy but... paleo art. Um, so I. I enjoy but that. I'm not sure if any any living animal can put this position right now i was thinking of kangaroos like a, but yeah like no. i mean like a giraffe doesn't do that yeah but, obviously it looks different yeah but, but that's, that's another point because it, indeed it's really difficult for example uh, to assess a uh, detail uh, mm -hmm. in living that's animals true. yeah yeah because you can say okay the closest living animal with a tail like a sauropod one is uh, the uh, crocodiles mm -hmm. but it's not completely the same uh, and also, if we are looking for a huge animal with tail, in in uh, actually there is no. I mean, look for example, elephants with tiny tails. Yeah, true. Uh, hippopotamus uh -huh. also tiny tails. Rhinoceros also tiny tails. You're so, right. I yeah, never thought about that. Uh, Jarafish also tiny tails. Yeah. So although they are mammals, no, but. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah. Uh, we cannot study what is the use of the tail of a in a huge animal with uh, living animals. Mm -hmm. So it's really difficult. So for that, I'm not sure. I mean, there's a lot of um, great art that is also yes. that, of course, like a lot of paleo artists are also they are either like really into the science and they consider mm -hmm. all the science or they're scientists themselves, like, like yes, some true. scientists also do paleo art. Um, but there is a lot of creative freedom, right? Like we still don't know, like the color, like, we, we don't know all the colors. <laughs> like that is like a lot of freedom. Um, or when you try to find out like how, what it looked like when dinosaur made it, they were like, a lot, yes. if you go on Google and you're like mating dinosaurs, they're like all these oh, like really interesting. Oh, we have interesting... in Spain a museum with a reconstruction of two, two rexes. Oh, I think I've seen that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But there's like a lot of art about that too. So Yes, you... I mean, uh, you can suggest, but uh, in the end, uh, these are only hypotheses. So yeah, yeah but it, it would be really nice to test that in the, in the computer too. So thank you for- Maybe you have to for... come back. <laughs> yes, yes. We have another um, question. Um, what about the, okay, I'm gonna pronounce that wrong, wrong. facey? Yeah. About the it. muscles and the position of organs, do you model them too? Well, uh, I try, but All right. again, it, it's difficult too, because in this case, wait, I'm going to go back. For that, I need to say that I have an amazing collaborator that is the one that also is also a paleo artist, Oliver Demuth. Of course, yeah. Yes, <laughs> and he has helped me a lot. Oh, you have to wait. click into the uh, yeah. white, I think. Uh, yeah. He's helped me a lot on the reconstruction of Yarafatitan. And he also, with the team, also take into account all the all these kind of things, also the, um, the fat, of the of the specimens in the reconstructions in the paper, we also uh, think it, take into account the cartilage. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but in the end, um, yeah, if you want to have the most accurate uh, reconstruction, you need to take this into account. But for simple approaches, it it is not needed. I mean, it's, it really it looks really cool for paleo art, let's say. But look, for example, in this case, we have the anus here. Anus? <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, I cannot put the mouse here. here. So yeah, as you can see, there are, uh, oh my God. <laughs> we try to reconstruct all the things that at least we consider are really important for the final reconstruction, no? So 
Yeah, I hope this answers your question. But in the end, in the publication or the final images, we only put, uh, yeah, for making everything more simple. Yeah. Because if not, you have a lot of information and it's really difficult. I, I can tell you the first models were, what am I looking at? What yeah. is it? So, but yeah, it's, it's, really, it's really great trying to provide with this information too. Also, because I think a few months ago, there was a, I cannot remember who was, a dinosaur was found with the cloaca. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I cannot remember the name or, or when. So this yeah. information is really useful for, for the reconstruction. Okay, we were here. Yes. And also related with the movement. We still have uh, 20 minutes. So <gasps> oh my God. I go fast. <laughs> okay, don't worry about that. We can speak about that later. Another uh, project on, on the speed of T-Rex uh, also showed that indeed uh, with the balance of the tail, the preference uh, speed was indeed 1.2 meters per second. So, mm. But that was the, the normal walk. So this, uh, I think it was Just like a, a dog. Yeah, yeah something like okay. that. And with that, we can also make uh, analysis on the stress of the, in this case, the, the dentaries uh, of the, the T-Rex and another, no, yeah, T-Rex and another theropods. Like for example, when they chew, when it's going to, the, the muscles, uh, when they are going, where they are going to make the larger stresses mm -hmm. and when, where they can break and this kind of studies. And also related with science outreach, this is really interesting and also really important because the digitization of the of the fossils also provides like this is Tristan when it uh, was in the Museum Fiona Durkunde. And if I remember correctly, I think most of the skeleton is the original one, mm -hmm. with the exception of the skull that was was digitized by photogrammetry. Mm -hmm. And the skull that is in the mount is uh, a 3D printer, no? Correct, yeah. Um, the original one uh, was in a glass cabinet just close to the to the skeleton. So this is really nice, not only for uh, researchers, like for example, you had access to it uh, more yeah, easily. Yeah, you can easily yeah. pull it out. Also, it's so heavy that it would have been yes. difficult to mount. Also, that's one of the reasons it's just too heavy. Yeah, no, but indeed, yeah. it's, it's really nice because uh, you are preserving the real skeleton, mm -hmm. but also making it accessible to everybody. It's also nice because the, mm -hmm. the way the position is, the skull is quite high. So with the one you showed earlier, Trix, the one that was the model like walking, that's yeah. at Naturalis, the, the skull is further, like the way they positioned that specimen is more like further down. So people can stand in front of it and see oh, it. Cool. But for us, the position was um, a different one. So it was higher up. Mm -hmm. So to have it on the ground as well, people can really, as you can see, get really close and see yes. details. So I think um, the way the museum did it was just perfectly, you know, totally. I liked it. And um, what the, we can do more things. We, wait, I don't know if it's going to work. Also, these digital technologies that yeah. are really nice. <laughs> Is it going to crash the app? <laughs> oh, you think? Oh, wait. We'll see. Oh, oh I remember yes. this. Well, it's like with a smartphone. <laughs> Like yes, nice uh, I, I will put the video, but you have this video in, in YouTube. Um, yeah, with this digital information, we can make uh, science more, even more accessible to everybody. Because, uh, for example, in the pandemic times that we were all, all was closed, uh, you can access the, the collections in the video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a sound. And um, also, if you have uh, three glasses, you can see at the reconstruction of the Arapatitan, like it, it was alive. So right. yeah, I remember that. It's really nice for making science accessible to everybody. Yeah. And um, wait, we have another question. Yes. Also YouTube. <laughs> Sitacosaurus. Yeah, the one found with this cloaca preserved. Someone else says stuff. Yeah. Thank you. It's not a sauropod, so I forgot about it. No, no, all of them are <laughs> If it's not a sauropod, you don't care. It's like no, me I'm... about rocks that don't have fossils in them. I'm like, it's a pretty looking rock, but I don't, like, no. <laughs> no, I mean, this is also important because uh, we have so many discoveries and papers published uh, in the years uh, about the uh, dinosaurs and paleontology that in the end, you know that something happened, 
that something was published somewhere yeah, but, yeah but, okay what was it and you cannot remember until thank you somebody yeah. somebody says it's a good it's a good reality check because i get the question um from people all the time if there's still discoveries like is there still do you still find dinosaurs I'm like yeah. yes <laughs> every single year yeah yes yeah um just to finish, mm -hmm. uh, with these 3D models, we can also make uh, go to the schools and go and do workshops because, for example, uh, you can digitize a, a fossil and with this fossil, you can make it larger or smaller if mm -hmm. it's a large one. And this way, for example, people with uh, problems in their vision mm -hmm. or, or even if you, uh, there's a a fragile fossil you can make the 3d print so other people can touch it yeah and, it's cool or make yeah a, a, like a, just make it more accessible yeah totally for, for everybody like yeah some museums already do that like the Neues museum has like a like some models for visually impaired people that they can touch oh, yes i need so to it's go really cool yeah oh yeah. cool so just like the egyptology like they have like some stuff where people can see with their hands it's very cool yeah, and this was like 3D imaging, right? They've done mm -hmm. it like that. Yeah. I mean, in the end, the museums are a, an institute that must um, give to the people too. Mm -hmm. it's a, so it's a really nice way of uh, making science more yeah, funnier mm -hmm. and so everybody can learn. Yeah. And also, I think this can help to understand oh, what is happening. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, to understand this uh, last slide that indeed by sharing our knowledge on, in this case, paleontology, uh, we are helping the people becoming more aware of uh, the science that surrounds their lives. And this could also help imagine in these difficult times that we are currently living to understand uh, what is happening, what has happened, and um, to value the things that, uh, the, yeah, natural heritage mm -hmm. and everything. So, and maybe within these people, there is one child that in the future can help so, to solve some of these problems. So, yeah, and in this case, digital technologies are really help and helping also paleontologists to share all our knowledge, not only yeah. in relation with research, as you have seen, but also to give the public uh, all, mm -hmm. all the information they deserve in the end. I mean, it helps so much to also get feedback. Yes, because you, totally. you, you You start to think about your work in a different way. Like, that's how it was for me when someone asked a question. I'm like, I've never thought about that. Yes, <laughs> and yes. um, you, uh, every time you share your work, you can go back to it with an like, uh, additional perspective, which I think is very valuable. Totally. And yeah, that was the last <laughs> slide. You have here my, my email. Are you on one of the crates? Ah, yes. You are. That's so <laughs> cool. I forgot about that. Amazing. Yeah, this Where was, was taken by, by Heinrich. <laughs> I said, oh, make a picture of me with Jarafa Titan. This is the only time in my life that I think I'm going to be able to have one like this. So Cool. Yeah. I also remember we went to see Jurassic World together now. Yes. The first yes, or the second? The second one? uh yes i think it was the second one we both wore our jurassic park t-shirts yes i remember yes too. <laughs> so i just went when i saw that picture cool pictures so thank you so much oh, oh thank I'm you just, for having me here it was so much fun to talk to you we have we have yes. i mean i also have questions for myself but of course we're going to answer your questions first uh what are your wishes for future science communication and paleontology my wishes what um, is like your best case scenario what do you hope will continue to happen or which will be changed? Mm, I, Say funding. Say funding. Yeah, okay. No, <laughs> totally funding. We need funding for that, but also in relation with teaching scientists mm. how to, to outreach science. Because me, myself, indeed, I know that I lack a lot of, uh, ex well, experience, no, but theory on this. And I still struggle when trying to share my knowledge and experiences with the general public looking for an easy way to communicate my, well, you've seen, I don't know how to describe what is a phylogenetic analysis. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, I think it does is my wish to mm -hmm. every paleontologist, well, yeah, in this case, we are speaking about paleontology. Every paleontologist to have the opportunity to participate in this kind of events 
Um, yeah, at least have some courses on that. I want to really like, I mean, you already said it, but when I started doing science communication, it's like I started that quite young when I, when I started here as an intern. Um, the museum is very good at providing ways where you can, if you want to, um, join like Long Night of Science or something like that. Yeah, true. But university, at least when I studied, there was zero, zero about science communication. It was all like this, like we had to write reports or do field oh, work, yeah. but there was not a single mention ever of how to really share your knowledge with a non-academic audience. Mm. Like, of course they say, oh, don't use jargon. It's like, okay, I know. Yeah, yeah, okay, I have to. But you also have to trust your audience to understand. Like mm -hmm. if you, like no one wants to leave out information that's cool because they think, oh, they're not gonna understand. Like they're just people like us, we're just normal people, right? So I always like to introduce new information and words and just explain what it is. Like, I don't know all the words. Yeah. Like if, if I hear, like, I have a lot of people around me that do computer science and I'm just like, I understand nothing. But then they say, this is, then they explain it. And then I'm like, okay. <laughs> I mean, don't ask me to explain blockchain, but <laughs> it's like difficult. But they also um, teach me new things. Like just because yes. you're a scientist doesn't mean you know everything, right? It's like, we're on a kind of little bubble. So I always like to hear what other people have to say about their science because I'm very nosy and I love hearing about what you do and what other people do. But the future is like we need more training, I think. Yes, totally. More opportunities, more funding to make this happen. At least the government in Germany now has science communication in their mm -hmm. new proposal. So I hope there's going to be more money or attention. I mean, the museum is very good at communicating science, I feel like, but not everybody's so lucky. <laughs> Um, I feel like that's uh, I want maybe more courses at university or yeah because training. indeed it's also the way that we scientists explain our things our projects to the people uh, how are they going to be interested or not on them also and this is going is going to be reflected on society and I think one of the these huge problems about what is happening right right now for example with all these denial things mm -hmm. is partly because of us because we don't we haven't engaged in the past with the public at least uh, at the level they deserve yeah so also the yeah. money comes from taxes very yeah. often so you all funding our work <laughs> so it's actually an, i feel like an obligation to give back right yeah totally but if there's no, um, not enough support, scientists also, I mean, it's still a job. Of course, it's a passion, but it's also a job. You have to get your work yes. done as, as well. There are deadlines and everything. So I think it's sometimes hard if you have a research project and you have funding for a certain time to also then do science communication. But sometimes you have to do science communication or you don't get the funding. Yeah, so, totally. I know. <laughs> you know, yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah. But in the end, it's really funny. Yes. yes. <laughs> I'm glad you saying that. <laughs> I think we had another one. Ah, uh, no. No, that was together. But I have some. Yes. So, um, I, I mean, I know how it was for me, but um, how was for you, like, using all this software? Like, it looks quite complex, the modeling. Yes. Was it kind of like learning by doing? Or did you have someone be like, I'll sit you down and show you how you use this computer with this software? Like, was it quite difficult? It was highly difficult, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but in the beginning, uh, Heinrich Mallison and Matteo mm -hmm. uh, both uh, helped me a lot, especially with uh, Metasafe and the, the other software I use for making the, the reconstruction. But at some point, their contracts ended, they had to leave, mm -hmm. I was alone, and I said, okay. So I sent them a lot of emails, but Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the end, I say, okay, I think I'm maybe spamming them too much. <laughs> um, and they were really kind, I need to say that. But yeah, it has been most of the time like self learning, mm -hmm. looking in, in forums, in blogs, in, for example, uh, for the edition of these meshes, I, I contacted uh, several computer engineers and I've learned a lot of things. But uh, yeah, there is one moment you reach like a, 
a threshold mm -hmm. and it's difficult you to pass it without help. And that is the moment when I say, okay, I need to attend a course. Yeah. And uh, most these times I, for example, I just uh, did a, a course on Python mm -hmm. for programming because uh, I'm already spamming another, <laughs> <laughs> another <laughs> collaborator about the, the it's a software, the one of the movement of the tail, because I, I, I only know the basics of this program. And she, he said, oh, I need to get all these values. And it's really painful going one by one. OK, don't worry. I'm going to make you a script. And then you will have uh, all the information in one. Wow. And I say, oh, this is amazing. But People then, who know this like programming language, they're yes. like, this Super is years. like magic. I yeah. Mean, <laughs> but yeah, I, I have been spamming him a lot also. And I say, okay, I think I'm going to look for a Python mm -hmm. course because if not, he's going to hate me. So. Yeah. <laughs> but I must say that, yeah, as you said at the beginning, don't be afraid to ask when you mm -hmm. have a, a problem, when you have a Question? question. <laughs> uh, because most of the people will answer you mm -hmm. really kindly. Yeah. So it's it's amazing this uh, kind of uh, positive feedback that it exists most of the time mm -hmm. between researchers. Yeah. So and don't make the mistake I did do my bachelor's when I started using Azirex. The data I had was you, you said it earlier, it was kind of like very noisy. It was like yeah. like fuzzy. And I remember I was looking at these images and I was describing what I saw and I just like what is that what I don't understand what's happening here it's like a weird is this a fracture what is this and I was like losing my mind and then it turned out it was a smudge on my laptop screen oh no it was like a speck like a dirt or something yes. I was like <laughs> it was late at night it was like midnight I had been looking at the computer like a long time I was like what is that what is that I don't know why it's in none of the other images you know and then I was like oh my screen is dirty <laughs> okay <laughs> I mean that was like I don't know 2014 or something um yes late nights and not knowing what you're doing <laughs> and one important screen. thing that uh, we researchers need to learn also that we need to find this moment when we need to stop. Yes, correct. Yes. <laughs> that was it's my moment. Really I was like, important. no. <laughs> I was like, I'm turning this off for the day. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't know uh, in the beginning how much tech I needed to know. Mm. So that is like something that was an eye opener. Yeah, paleontology is not like Alan Grant anymore. No, not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. Um, Right. Yeah. At some of the questions you answered, but um, how did the current situation, you know, we all know what I'm talking about, um, changed how you work. I mean, mm -hmm. I know you're working with fossils and not life experiments, but has there been a change like working from home? Is, is that possible? Like um, what was the biggest hurdle? I was lucky that I had most of the fossils completely digitized. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I only needed my laptop. So it was not a huge change in this regard. But in my case, I have two kids. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, last year, without kitas and with homeschooling, we only had one laptop. And yeah, mm. it was a little bit horrible at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Later too, but uh, I, <laughs> we, ha I, we had to buy another laptop for my oldest son. Um, but yeah, in, in, it was a mess this time with two S's. <laughs> um, but to try, I mm. mean, uh, until you realize that, okay, everybody's passing for the same, yeah. is having the same experiences as you. Uh, when I had to, to write my supervisors and everything, they were really supportive that don't worry if you don't have time or whatever happens, don't stress, uh, take your time. I had an extension of my contract and indeed this was really nice because I have been able to, to join my two contracts. Mm -hmm. So the day I finished the other one, the next day I started the new one. That's great. Um, yeah, in my case, it has been a nice experience okay. within as far all the as bad it goes, things. Yeah, yeah but if, but yeah, psychologically, it has been a little bit of a struggle. Yeah, 
So in, in relation with my work, no, because indeed this year I, has been, I have been really productive, <laughs> but I'm not sure if this has been also a, a reflection of the, I was trying not to think about what was happening in my environment. Right, or, you're very like... Yeah, yeah, I don't know, but yeah, something, it, it was not good, I mean. Yeah, so, I think everybody can relate. Yeah. Um, I have two last questions for the last five minutes we have, um, which I always ask. Um, so I'm going with, with the bad one first. <laughs> so what is the worst part of your job? The worst? What is the worst about being a paleontologist in, in, in your mm. case? Oh, that is indeed a difficult one. No, it's, it's not bad, but it's difficult because uh, I imagine that depends on the day <laughs> <laughs> or the project I'm doing. I really hate uh, repetitive tasks. So really, like really. so like photogrammetry then? <laughs> yeah, but that's the point. That it's, it's uh, really funny because, oh, you are paleontologist. You need to go to the field. It's mm. every day the same. Or you are doing photogrammetry, is every day the same? Yeah. Or you are working with 3D models, is every day the same? <laughs> but, um, that is why I try to mix to, it up. Yeah, I yeah. try to make a little little partitions between the day. So, for example, I work uh, I don't know x hours with a uh, photogrammetry, then. I go and work a little bit on reconstruction, mm -hmm. then I go and work a little bit on the classical paleontology of comparing the specimens and describing bones and everything. And so all that's the, same, the same. Okay. Interesting. Some people say writing grant proposals. You know Applying what? for money. <laughs> you know what? In the end, I it's stupid what I'm going to say. I like this part because. I've already have so much experience right. on this. It's easy now. <laughs> oh, it's like, I know what I, I mean. I, I have been rejected a lot of times, <laughs> but I found this, I found this easy in the way that, oh, I know how to do the proposal. And I know that it will depend on the reviewers if they right, are yeah. going to like my, my project or not. Mm -hmm. It's not only about me and how I That's do true. the proposal, the structure. So it's, Oh, okay, in the same structure. Okay, I need to predict this and tune, tune, tune. So it's not really difficult. Then I'll message you if I need inspiration. <laughs> I'll review that. But what is your favorite part? Like, what's the best part? Oh, learning. I love to learn. That's I mean, a nice it's a, um, and I think that is a problem because I get involved in too many projects <laughs> and, you know, yeah. because I say, oh, we need the help on doing this. Oh, I love that. Although I don't have any experience on that. Don't worry. I'm going to learn about uh, this. So in the end, I have uh, thousands of projects I in, know what that's like. in preparation, <laughs> but it's okay. I need to focus in, in some of them, not in all of them, but I just started to learn how to say no. Yeah, I think I, I need to. Because I'm always like, no, this is a great opportunity. I want to do this. But now I'm I slowly but surely learning to be like, you know what? That sounds really cool, but I can't do it. But here's a list of people who might be available. Yeah. So I'm like trying to say no sometimes. But you know that I, I should learn that too. But it's the same for reviewing papers mm. because uh, as scientists, we receive a... a Requests by, request, papers, uh, yeah. by journals for reviewing the manuscripts of, a, of another uh, researcher, no? For say, okay, this is good, this is uh, not as good as should be, you need to, to change it. And some journals use this clickbait yeah, that is, yeah. oh, do you want to review? this paper with this amazing abstract and you're like and of said, course i do oh i don't know like but FOMO. Yeah. <laughs> well, oh, that's I not the best time. part let's be honest <laughs> so yeah it's, it's the learn, same yeah. yeah i like discovering new things that's good good answers and um good questions also from from yeah. viewers so thank you so much for being here today and participating and asking all these questions. Thank you for being here. Thank it's you. It's been long overdue. And thanks again. And if people want to find you, they can see uh, your Twitter on the um, screen right now and your email. If they want to also bother you with questions, I <laughs> they can, or not bother. Uh, no, I be, said, don't be afraid to ask. You. Yeah, then uh, they can reach you that way. And 
yeah, it's the end of the year. It's the end of Coffee Clutch for a while at least. So maybe I'll get a real break for once. I don't remember the last time I didn't think of Coffee Clutch on a break. So it's going to be my first vacation, Christmas vacation without oh, only thinking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know, because I also said no to some things, not Coffee Clutch, but so now I can actually go on a vacation, which is going to be insane <laughs> and exciting. Oh, cool. So, um, but yeah, if uh, Coffee Clutch comes back, then you'll know if you follow also the museum uh, social medias um, or our social media will be there. And as always, um, we would like to hear your feedback if you have any for us. I think my um, amazing team will post um, a survey in the chat again. I think there it is and also on the YouTube. So if you want to tell us how you liked it, then you can let us know. And yeah, thanks so much for being here and supporting us for the last few years. It's been absolutely amazing and a joy to do Coffee Clutch and learn so much about the amazing research at the museum and also outside of the museum. And I hope I'll all see you again in some way or another. So enjoy your advent <laughs> and your holidays in the new year. And hopefully next year we'll have more exciting science and less pandemic talk <laughs> yes please yes please <laughs> so thank you so much and have a great time and yeah happy new year thank you bye